Hello everybody and welcome to Stowe Murray's and air show time as it's prop wash and we're delighted to have been welcomed up here by Ian Flint. So we're going to be going around the museum, looking at some of the aircraft and seeing just how fabulous a place this is. And I'm happy to report that the quiche is as incredible as it was made out on our last podcast with Ian. So welcome to Stowe Murray's. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. We've escaped the sun because it's been a beautiful sunny day out there. We're coming into the museum here at Stowe Marie's. My wonderful wife, Wendy, is our camera lady who will be asking some of the questions as we go around. But this is really, really nicely done. So if we wander in, they all start off with the life of the RFC here at Stowe Marie's. And we've got a few examples from Captain Fanstone and moving through into what a pilot would be expecting when they came out here to Essex during the First World War. And what's fun is any good museum has stuff you can touch really. So all over the place are these fantastic little touch screens where we can go into the history of the museum. Now check out our previous video with Ian where we go into this in a lot more detail because as we move through this original building from the First World War, we're going to be able to see more and more about what's going on. Can I just well, say something? You can. The life, these, these people are very lifelike. <laughs> They're very lifelike. They are good mannequins. They are. Yeah. Yeah, every once in a while you come to somewhere and the mannequins look a little bit hingy. But in this case, they are very well done and well lit as well. So there you go. Get in there. Show them off. Bedpan as well. Oh yeah, can't forget the bedpan. Can't forget the bedpan. Now this being the Royal Flying Corps still nominally attached to the army, armories were very important. So there we go. A little bit of a ticking off going on there as I wave my hand and hit the, <laughs> hit, the um, hit the sensors. But we've got SMLE3s over on there. Standard rifle on for just about everybody, not used in the air, thankfully, because it's hard enough to hit something on a target. Lewis gun on the back, but just again, fun stuff. Over here, we've got the popular school raid from 1917, big raid by the Zeppelins as well. And as we start moving through the museum, that level of original blitz that there was in the First World War starts to play out because. We tend to think that's all a 1940, 1941 thing, but really, from about 1916 onwards, there were raids all across the eastern seaboard of, of the UK, whether that be the crazy German Navy going after things or not. But in this case, we've got a, a Gotha forward fuselage here, and again, touch screens that can show us exactly what was going on at the time. So you can see that's not a lot of raids when we consider what would happen 30 years later, but this was completely unheard of during the time. And you know, on the night of the 1670, we've just picked one here, 1918, you've got four Zeppelin struck in giants, massive biplanes, and a Zeppelin as well coming in to bomb people who had no idea of what this was like. And of course, if we look down on the floor, when we hit, if we go back into London, because why not? Here we go. And we pick one of those. We can see where on the, the map of the city that actually is. So Whitechapel, 
six gothers bombing in over there. It's very tastefully done. And we also have to mention good loos as well. But air fighting's in its infancy. Well, we've got the SMLE, standard infantry rifle over here. You can start seeing yeah, MG14s, MG08, 15s, the classic Lewis gun mounted on the top wing of, of the SE5, and then the Vickers, the sort of quintessential First World War British machine gun. These things are infantry weapons that are being put to use in the air. So not are they being adapted for the craziness of high velocity, high altitude fighting. They're just in there, very air cooled, very neat. And of course there's better people than them to talk about. further, we start getting into the women of the First World War. And that's always something that needs talking about, because as we come through on the side, we sort of hear about the, the nurses and things, but they have specific exhibitions for the women who went to war. And that is, yeah, we know about musicians, workers, but over on the other side, we have the full nurses, not just the volunteers as well. And of course, a fantastic display over here of some of the artifacts from there. The women of the First World War didn't get sort of the recognition that maybe say the ATA did in the second. And that's why Ian and the team here have made sure that this whole middle section of the museum is dedicated from them. So whether it's the, the WAX, the Auxiliary Army Corps, the Women's Royal Air Force, or the Wrens, this is where they had their starts in that First World War. an aerodrome. We've, we'll go and have a look at some of the aircrafty bits as we did later, but we can sort of see the sort of rudimentary type of engines 
they will get big radials spinning along with the propeller to keep them cool, creating massive amounts of torque, whether they be early Vs, um, which were sort of more liquid cools as the, the BE2 that we had a look at outside already was flown by. Not a lot of power when we're talking about it, but very much coachworky levels of, of build. Yeah, this is 20 years into the car and then suddenly we're flying around at 100 miles an hour in the air. Crazy times. But again, we're looking at artesian build sort of things, handmade propellers, see our interview with Alania from Culver Props as well, but wonderful cars. And it's just very, very tidily done. So we'll move into armaments again in a second, but who wouldn't want a nice 1913 Humber? Because look at it. It's tidy. <laughs> it's great for a Sunday day out for the pub. Can't go very fast though. No, but you don't need to go very fast, do you? So up on the wall on the back is an FE2 propeller, that sort of classic four blade in there. Fixed pitch. And again, as we talked about with Alania, these sorts of things were designed for a very specific performance window. And if you're either side of it, you weren't going to be getting that from the aircraft. So very much no throttles, just blipping the amount of fuel going into the engine to control your speed. So let's wander through to the end. Actually, before we wander through to the end, can we be a great war pilot? So, Wendy, let's see how many points I get for this, right? So do yeah. I measure up? Um, Are you a man? Score one. Yeah, Nom nominally, we'll, we'll go for that. So we have one. Am I between 18 and 30? Mentally, yes. <laughs> we'll take two for that. Uh, the weight. Take the fifth. Okay, we won't talk about that one, but we won't give myself a score. Am I taller than five foot two? Yes. There we go. But am I less than six foot? No. Okay. Good eyesight. 
perfect. I'm giving myself a point for that. Um, now I've got to put these back on to read this. Um, it is an advantage if you're already a pilot with a Royal Flying Club certificate. No. Am I well educated? I went to school in Croydon, so no. Um, don't really want to be a soldier. Yes, there we go. And have a desire to get out of the trenches. Oh my goodness, yes. So I have six points. Unfortunately, you needed a 10 out of 10 score mm. on this basic test, so. So if you had a vagina, then you had, a, you know, no chance. No chance at all. And which is probably still a lot of the case today. Probably. Yeah. As, as is the case. But again, fun little things in, in there. Irish linen, wrapping all the aircraft, we can get a, a feel for what they are. And remembering this stuff, as beautiful as it is, um, whether you're cheese quaffing it or doing, you're flying around in a thing made of wood wrapped in highly flammable paint. Uh, what, what a horrible, horrible way to go. You can see how maneuverable it is. Very expertly flown by John. All the pilots are flying them regardless of it. Now the final part of the museum is Essex at War, which is quite fun, but what we do have is some excellent examples of the flying gear that was coming through. Now you've got essentially sheepskin, single ply, jackets, masks in there going through there. Remember that you're breathing in castor oil from a 100% loss engines as well. So it's cold, you're flying up above 10,000 feet, there's no oxygen and you're wearing something that most people would wear out and about today. Over here, we have a mini scary hat room, which we should always do next time we go out to see Scott in um, Arizona, because he has a fantastic collection of First World War tunics and things, but it's wool. You know, there's a couple of chaps walking around in full tunics today, melting, which is, which is not great. But this is just one of the areas at the museum that you can fall around and it's very well done and of course well worth a visit. So we're gonna go have a look at a couple of the other bits and we'll see you then. Our team is coming in from the left to right in box formation. So one of the exhibitions they have going on here at Stowe Maris is all about the world without wires because in the Great War, radio tele telephony, I can even say it right, there may have been beer, came on leaps and bounds and thankfully we have stolen the man himself, <laughs> Ian Flynn, the boss here at Stowe Maris who we've chatted to before but we thought as he had a couple of minutes before you've got to go out and shout at airplanes, <laughs> we'd just get you to talk us around in here because this is a fantastic exhibition of yeah, we're sitting here with wireless microphones. We're used to Bluetooth and all that wonderful mm. things, but this is the genesis of it all. Isn't absolutely, it? absolutely. And uh, just for the record, it's great to have you here. Oh, so thank you so much. It's, it's, nice, nice, it's nice to see all of you, not yeah. just that. Yeah, I was going to say, rather than screen. <laughs> okay, so words without wires. First yeah. things first, we're in the comms building, which is half of the building that survived the Great War. The other half got hit in a random bombing run in World War II. But the bit that's left, the comms building, is where all the writers and clerks used to be, and we're pretty sure there was a radio on the other side of that wall. Okay. But most of it was telephony, as you say. Yeah. So the idea of actual having radio communication with the ground was something quite mad and quite 
completely revolutionary mm. because obviously what we do is we drop streamers and messages and yes. stuff like that. Pigeons. And we know, uh, we know that the, the pilots here did practice that for when they went back to the front because they practiced it by dropping messages requesting jam to tip tree jams <laughs> up the road. And we've got the flyers and both of us at both sites have got our flyers and messages. This exhibition itself though, I always think of it as Jules Verne's play room because there's lots of brass and wooden mm. boxes and sparks and I expect Frankenstein's monster to be brought in. <laughs> so the whole purpose of this exhibition was to explain how one goes from, well, hang on, we know if we've got power, we make a spark. How can we turn that into a form of communication? Naturally, if you're communicating with people on the ground, you're flying really slowly, trying to drop a message. Yep. And then they said, okay, well, we'll make a radio small enough that you can fit it in an aircraft. All you need to do is trail this aerial and fly really slowly. So if you're, I don't know, spotting for the enemy and you're flying really slowly in your linen and wooden plane, <laughs> dragging a huge aerial, I don't know, there might be some clues there about yeah. what the Germans or the Italians are going to do to you. Naturally, though, it goes without saying that that moved on, as you said, in leaps and bounds. This exhibition explains how the first use of really, truly wireless technology mm -hmm. took place and was tested here at Stomari's. Um, I imagine it's completely unrelated to Marconi being living up the road. There, there's, there's, there might be, might be a tangential link to that. Who one. knows? Yes. Who yeah. knows? What were the fascinating things uh, here? We actually mentioned it before mm. the girl guiding exhibition that we had here for a couple of years. The girl guides were Marconi's secret messengers. Mm -hmm. So he, they used to run messages all over the place. Here we did all this testing, and if you spend some time in this exhibition, it will tell you how we went from dropping messages to being able to send Morse code signals back but doing it from a high enough vantage point that you weren't at risk from ground fire, you didn't have to fly slowly and it was, as you say, the genesis of wireless technology as today. Fantastic. As you have to dash, we're going to pick one thing. What is your highlight in this exhibition? Um, I'm putting you on the spot. You are, yeah. you are. I'll be honest, I, I love this section over here but back here and this is where I'm going to get told off by my museum chums because back here we've got an interactive mm -hmm. and it was designed from scratch by our volunteers. It was installed by our volunteers. And it's a chance for you to have a go at not only hearing what it's like for a message to come over in Morse in your headphones while you've got engine noise and gunfire, then you've got a chance to actually try and send one back. And I have never met anyone who can actually send a message in Morse. <laughs> the, it's, it's really interesting. Morse code, which wasn't invented by Morse and isn't a code, don't even get me started on that one. Um, what we know is Morse code was sent with a series, as we know, of dots and dashes. Yep. What a lot of people don't realize is those dots and dashes, how you did it was as individual as handwriting mm -hmm. and they called it your fist. And right the way through from the Great War when they thought all around Essex was loads and loads of spies into the Second World War, there were ho huge amounts of intelligence time dedicated to working out who was on the other end. Mm -hmm. Because if you knew their handwriting, you knew their fist, you could work out if they were on your side or not, even if they were saying yeah. the right things. And in the Second War, there's a very famous example where because we knew that you could be compromised, we put special code words in that if I say, hello, everything's fine, by the way, isn't it a lovely day? Oh, hang on, the code word, it's a lovely day, means they've been compromised and they're yeah. being under duress. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a wonderful example in Holland where there was a ring of spies that had been caught up and they sent back their message, hello, hello. Oh, by the way, isn't it a lovely day? And the British person on the end went, stop messing around, don't use those ciphers. Don't you know that that's going to make us think you've been taken by the Germans? <laughs> hello? Hello? Is there anyone there? Did it, did, did, did. And for some strange reason, all those radio operators were shot. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's not without its pitfalls. But that actual interactive there with the Morse sender, I love it. We have schools come in here and they all have the same trouble. They all naturally try and do rude words yeah. and they can't. <laughs> rude words are hard in Morse. Yeah. Rude words are hard in yeah. Morse, but they're very hard when you try and do it with the sound of, uh, of aircraft yes. and engines. <laughs> but I won't ask you to play with that now because obviously I've got a gallop away. Yeah. Um, what I would say is all the exhibitions open today. Hopefully you have a great time wandering around. We'll catch up again before you go. Definitely. But you've got many jobs to do. So I have. I've we'll, got to we'll, we'll go shout at aircraft. Yeah, that's the fun bit. And then we'll take a picture of you standing around looking like a lemon later. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm halfway there. Let's say it looked like an orange. Oh, orange, that's better. Super. Thank you, Ian. No worries. Switzerland, France, it found its way to the UK in 1970. 
So we've reached the end of the day here at Stone Marie's and we couldn't leave without speaking to Suzanne, who's the assistant curator and, to be fair, runs the place really. Ian's, <laughs> Ian's got the title, but Suzanne does all the hard work. Ian has told me about some of the fantastic exhibitions you've had on the, the Scouts one, the Girl Guides yeah. sounded fantastic. Just tell us about some of the things that we've had on at Stone Marie's and what we can look forward to coming up, really. So obviously the history of the site Mm -hmm. of the First World War is the, the reason why we're here, yep. but also it's the other elements that are involved as well. It's the wildlife around the mm -hmm. site, which is part of the history, and also it's uh, conservation, restoration, education, and we have school groups coming in. Um, we do about 200 school children each academic year. That's brilliant. Yeah. They come in, a, a lot of them are year two, so mm -hmm. they're six and seven, and they come in, uh, they have a presentation on flying with basic science experiments. Uh, they have lunch here in the mess, which is all reserved for them. And then our guides will take them around the site um, to learn and look about full-size planes in the hangar but then to also sit in the trucks and pretend to be drivers. <laughs> they sit in the interactives and pretend to be test pilots. <laughs> they have all of this space to be able to run around in, get rid of some energy. Um, it's all safe. So it's a fantastic education resource. Um, and also because coaches are so expen uh, expensive now, yep. schools are having trouble getting trips out, Sorry. but the local schools come here, they have a fantastic day. Um, and it, it shows the place, you know, active with learning and mm -hmm. youngsters getting interested in, in the place and history. That's fantastic. So, so that's always fantastic. We also have uh, girl guide groups. Mm -hmm. We did an exhibition on guiding the empire and all the work they did in the First World War. Um, we had an activity program for six months, one Saturday every month. And we had a theatre interpreter being Agnes Baden-Powell. <laughs> we had karate along the White Hanger. We had the blacksmith where they were all making toasting prongs. We had an overnight stay where they camped and then we we did the campfire songs and the s'mores <laughs> on the gas stoves. So we have all these elements for children. Um, the camping side, we're in um, conversations at the moment with Chelmsford um, mm -hmm. Scouting for them to come here and trial a sort of a, a camping overnight trial of, because we've got different areas depending on how many yeah. children, which depending on which one suits. But it's, so it's children, it's wildlife, it's education, it's history. There's all sorts of angles of this place of interest. I'm interested in social history, yep. which is why I sort of get involved with the children, because mm -hmm. I think it's important for them to, to learn and understand of all the changes within social history. Yes. Um, and then say so there's the volunteering. We're always looking for volunteers and that's in the mess, in the shop, research, um, guides, stewards. It, it's interesting, I've been eavesdropping Have on you? some of your volunteers and chatting to a few during mm. the day in the queue for quiche and beer, oh, the yes, important thing. Yes. And they're all so enthusiastic. Yes. It, it's the, the passion that they have yeah. for this place is, is palpable and it's, we, it's great to see. We have about 140 volunteers mm. here and we rely on their time and goodwill to come up here, help and make sure this place keeps going mm -hmm. and, and is still open for everyone to come and find us. But we always need more help because <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, some of us are exhausted. <laughs> And because of that, we're not going to keep you any longer, I can take the hint. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm heading to, uh, to Dayton Brewery. <laughs> but really, what can people do to support you? Whether that's volunteering, is it, is it coming up, is visiting, donating, all of that good stuff? It's everything. It's, it's volunt If anyone has spare time and they want to volunteer, please come along and come and chat to us, get mm -hmm. in touch with us. 
um, visiting us. Come in, have a look round. If you've been round once, you can actually come in free on a, a special wristband to just use the mess. Okay. You yeah. can use the shop and the mess. You don't have to pay an entrance fee. Come and have lunch, come and have breakfast, come and have afternoon tea. <laughs> we, you know, we have it all here. Donations, anyone that can spare anything, a donation would be lovely. It's, it's us meeting the public and helping them to invest in us and helping us do more of what we're doing. I feel terrible that I ghosted the inn for as long as I did because this place is wonderful. Shame it's, on you. I know it's terrible, <laughs> and I'm 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 happy to hold my hand up to that. Is yeah, we got we got the FE2 behind us, but the displays have been fantastic. Yeah. The, the commentary has been great, and everybody's just been having a lovely time. Yeah, and what a beautiful day for it. I mean, what an incredible yeah. day for it. I mean, we haven't had any sort of really risk of of anything nasty on the mm. weather today, so. And everyone that's been here, I've heard so many people say what a fantastic event it's been, how much they've enjoyed it, and how sort of friendly and welcoming everybody is. And that's what our, our you know, our plan on anything is for people to come here, enjoy themselves, go away and tell more people to come. Well, that's, that's our takeaway, is to tell as many people <laughs> as we can. Suzanne, Excellent. thank you so much for giving us a few minutes of your time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So we've come inside Hangar 2 now, which is where most of the aircraft lived when they're not out on the flight line. But what we wanted to look at was the Pulverizer Group's forward cockpit here of a handy page 0400, which was essentially Britain's first heavy bomber. And as you can see with the side off, rudimentary has been kind to it. You have steering wheel as you would on the car, plenty of cables and no protection whatsoever for the crew, the pilot, other than a very flimsy little bit of metal underneath the seat. So you're seeing this development of strategic bombing, pushing things forward, ranges are increasing, speeds are increasing, bomb loads are increasing, but at the same time, power limited, therefore you're looking for spruce and steel cable that's about all you're going to have to keep you up in the air and very large when you start considering it for the time which is really cool to see and again very beautifully done by the team at the pulverizer group
Yes. So the next part of the museum is the 37 Squadron office and just going through it's going to tell us briefly the story of 37 Squadron here at Stowe Marie's. So let's wander in, it also means we get out of the heat which will be quite nice. We well, see we open up with artist's impression of what the airfield looked like as well with the, the big hangars back in the day. There's a surprising amount already still here. So when you come up and visit, you'll actually see Water Tower and the Edmund Box all in there as well. So the airfield is as it was over 100 years ago, which is quite something. So what would happen when somebody shows up this is the boss's office, they're going to get told the lie of the land, spoken to about what's going to be going on in the squadron and when they're coming in. So again, pretty good mannequins and that sort of atmospheric additions of the museum to help us keep going. So we're not going to go through all the stuff that's on the panels because we want you to come up and have a look. So in the next room, if we sneak in, we have really that difference that's coming through, that move from the trenches up into the war. Yeah, you still have very posh people flying with their smoking jackets. But what you have as well is a sort of mixture of pilots that flew and their stories in here, whether it's their foot lockers in here, and again, different types of flying jackets and things that they're going to see. Pilots in the First World War, many came from the cavalry, so they're going to be still carrying their dress swords with it, which the RAF still do, because horses and airplanes are all very much of the same sort of thing. But throughout we're going to be seeing, as we have seen through the museum, little elements that are bringing the human touch to it. So all the panels are going to be pointing to people who have this direct connection with it. So as you're moving through the museum, through each of these beautifully restored buildings, you're going to get to meet a few people as you go, whether it's you know, Commander, Wing Commander Ridley, um, seeing him in his full gear as well. It's a lot of fun. So if we sneak, sneak around here. Yeah, the things that were still here to be restored, circuit boards and things, you wouldn't want that in your house, that's for sure. And of course, those who died operating out of Stone Marie's in the war. And if we head outside, we can see the memorial that's made for them. As the last of the aircraft have departed over on that side over there. So, I think it's right as we've been through the museum, we've seen the flying. It's safe to say this has been a fabulous place and we're shocked more people didn't come up here to prop wash. They have more events coming up, but the important thing is Stone Marie's needs your support. So whatever you can do, check them out on the website. All the links will be in the descriptions on the video in the pod. So be sure to do what you can and come up here. It's surprisingly easy to get to without the roadworks. The signage is fantastic. So thank you so much to Ian Flint for inviting us up, for having us here for prop wash. And we're going to be back because this has been a lot of fun. As I said, quiche is superb. So until next time, everybody, take care of yourselves. Do check in on all your friends. It's the time of year when sad things are happening. We've lost Graham Thorpe recently as well. So remember, if you haven't heard from someone, check them out. If you need a bit of help, reach out as well. So thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves. It's uh, even smaller still and uh, scarcely a lifting wing, but it did contribute to the maneuverability. There are, there were up to a G model B. B stands for Vario Experimental. So it did improve as it went on and it did last.
I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Dam Castiers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of ad. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowen and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.